and I'm interested in uh, are just questions about the distribution of primes. So uh, I tend to look at variations of a question. You take your favorite set of integers a, and so given so your favorite set of integers a, I just want to find out um, are there how many primes are there in a, and in particular are there infinitely many primes. Uh, so for example, you could take um, a to be the set of values of some polynomial, say the polynomial n squared plus 1. And then this would be asking, are there infinitely many primes? So the form n squared plus 1. Similarly, you could take a to be set of prime numbers all shifted along by 2. And then this would be asking, are there infinitely many twin primes? Uh, so these are two famous over 100-year-old problems that we have no idea of how to solve at all. Um, but to give an example of something which I do know how to solve, uh, we can think about looking at primes in very short intervals. Um, so let's take two parameters, x and y, big and equal to 2. Um, then there are many uh, z's between x and 2x such that the number of primes in the interval z up to z plus y is big and equal to some constant times log y. So c here is some fixed positive constant. So you think of c as 1 over a million. So just to pass this um, correctly, <coughs> this theorem is completely trivial if c times log y is less than or equal to 1 um, <laughs> by the pigeonhole principle. Um, however, if you take y to be some large constant, and then you're thinking of x is going off to infinity, this is shown infinitely many boundary gaps between primes. So there's infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by just some bounded amount, which would be whatever value of y is that suddenly makes this right-hand side bigger than 1. Um, but you can also do this with a bit of uniformity. But there's also another trivial bound uh, for the number of primes, which means that when uh, this right-hand side is less than equal to y over log x, this is again trivial. So we're thinking of y as being moderately small, so either a large constant or some quantity that's grown slowly with x. But this has shown that you can find intervals that contain unusually many primes, um, <coughs> and maybe more than you'd expect from average re reasons. Um, uh, no, so there exists some universal fixed globally constant c. So think of c as being 10 to the power minus 10 or something. No, so I mean, if you if you care very much about boundary gap stream primes, then you can be more careful for precisely when these thresholds are for when you get two primes and things like this. But if you want a nice uniform version like this that works for any choice of parameters, then uh, just think of C as some tiny absolute fixed yeah. constant. Sorry, what was that? You can write it down. Yeah. Okay. This is. This, should, this is a real effective constant that can be written down. You really should just think of it as 1 over a million or something like that. So you can show that there can be many primes that the difference is smaller than some large constant? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, if you want 100 primes that all have a bounded gap between them, I can produce some constant such that there's 100 primes which are all having at most that is the gap between them. And you can find this infinitely many sets of 100 primes doing this. Um, so that's one example of the original question I had. Um, but that's not really what I want to talk about today. Um, I'd like to talk about 
well, it's still think about finding some short intervals, but it's maybe taking a slightly more classical approach and thinking about their connections to the Riemann zeta function, which is something I haven't really thought about too much, but it's something that I would like to think about whilst I'm here at Princeton. Um, so <coughs> uh, maybe the easiest way to see the connection between primes and the Riemann zeta function is the explicit formula. So if I'm looking at prime powers p to the j up to some large number x, and I'm summing them with weight p, then I can write this as x minus the sum of x through rho over rho for all zeros rho up to some parameter t of the Riemann zeta function <coughs> plus some error term which is pretty small provided you take t reasonably big in terms of x. And so if we knew the Riemann hypothesis, then the real part of all the zeros would be of size 1 half. That means that each of these individual terms here, we could just put in absolute values, and they'll be of size roughly x to the half. And with a few small density results on the zeros, you could just very trivially treat these terms this would be some error term of size at most x to the half, and we'd get a very good approximation to the counting function of primes. And in particular, we'd be able to find prime every interval of which is slightly bigger than x to the half in length. This would automatically show that there is a asymptotic for the number of primes that interval. So Rh would imply that <coughs> Every interval x up to x plus a little bit bigger than x to the half contains primes. And so this is maybe uh, one of the classic reasons why the Riemann hypothesis is viewed as important in terms of its <coughs> knowledge about primes. Um, but this is a very nice but very strong assumption on the horizontal distribution of the zeros. And it turns out for many applications, such as this one, you actually don't need something as strong as the Riemann hypothesis. So one way to think about this is, well, there could be zeros that are off the half line, but provided there's not too many of them, we can still get lots of the conclusions that maybe we want to show. So one way to look at this is to have some counting function so I'll write n of sigma t as just counting all the zeros of the Riemann zeta function in a box, which is going up to height t and is to the right of the line real part equals um, sigma. So it's rho such that the real part of rho is big and equal to sigma, and the imagined part of rho <coughs> is of size at most t. And then the one conjecture is the density hypothesis which is the claim that n of sigma t is bounded above by t to the power 2 times 1 minus sigma plus epsilon. And uh, it turns out that the density hit hypothesis is sufficient to uh, get in this result about primes and intervals. It's basically as good as RH for that. Um, but it's clearly weaker, and so for at least from the point of view ap of applications, this is maybe something that you think is more likely to be able to be proved, um, uh, but it's maybe easier to prove than the Riemann hypothesis itself. Um, but unfortunately, we don't know how to prove the density hypothesis, and we've been very stuck at proving the density hypothesis. Um, but the density hypothesis is something that's much more natural to attempt to prove from the point of view of analytic techniques. So we can prove n of sigma t is bounded above by t to the 12 over 5 times 1 minus sigma plus epsilon, so 12 over 5 is 2.4, so it's only a little bit worse than 2. Um, and correspondingly, if you just assume this is a black box, you do get a result of this type, 
but instead of getting a half, you get 1 minus 1 over 12 over 5. And uh, here, a half is 1 minus 1 over 2. <coughs> um, so the summing of all of this is that you can get nice results that can be, in some cases, as strong as what you would know under the Riemann hypothesis if you have a good understanding of the horizontal distribution of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Even if the Riemann hypothesis is potentially not true, you can consider this alternative universe where there might be counterexamples. Um, the thing that I want to think about is um, to try and see, given our lack of progress on the density hypothesis, to try and consider uh, what the possible influence of the vertical distribution of zeros could be. Um, and in particular, uh, the sort of philosophy that I would like to test whilst I'm over here at Princeton is thinking about the possibility that um, if we're in an alternative universe where this density hypothesis is false and something like this is really the truth of what's happening, so there really are a lot of zeros which are counterexamples to the Riemann hypothesis on some line, then um, I have a vague guess that in fact these many counterexamples should come in a very structured format in some way, um, and they should have some explicit algebraic structure. So you should be able to, well, the dream would be to be able to put the zeros into two sets, random zeros, which would satisfy a density hypothesis type argument, and then structured zeros, which would have some uh, much more rigid description of their vertical distribution. And so when you're considering terms like this, uh, would give a structured secondary term to the counting function of the primes. Um, so that's what I like to think about. I have no idea if it's going to work or if it's completely pie in the sky. Um, but maybe I'll stop there. Thanks a lot. <laughs>